All right. Well, it is the season for advising and all sorts of questions like that, so I'm going to try and answer your questions after class, but uh, we've got to kind of jump back into our, our topic for this week um, and uh, try to get you guys up to speed and, and moving uh, on this, this technical stuff. Uh, again, you should be working on it with your topics and your groups. You did have a reading reflection due Monday. You have another one due this coming Monday, correct? Uh, oh, Tuesday, excuse me. Yes, you're right. Tuesday class is the, the deadline for those, so make sure you're staying on top of those. Uh, Blackboard does tag them as far as when you handed them in, even if I don't get to them right away. Uh, so that's one of the nice things about it is I can, I can see the timing of things and know who's late and who's on top of those things. But make sure you're staying on top of those things because they, they, hopefully you feel like those feed into what you're doing in, in your projects, basically giving you kind of historical context. That's, that's, uh, that's the main purpose, basically, uh, expanding and illuminating some of the context of what we're doing here. Um, we're continuing our work with processing, and last time I kind of got into some really technical stuff. Uh, I'm going to continue with that because I hope that this will, uh, again, get, equip you to understand when these topics come up in your readings, okay? Um, I do have an interactive patch toward the end of our time here, but if we could kind of gather together for the, for the beginning, for getting started to make sure everybody's focusing and on task, so kind of come away from the computers, but then I'll send you back to the computers for this little interactive patch that I have toward the end. Okay, um, which will hopefully further eliminate what these uh, coefficients do and the way that they interact with them. So, uh, what do you all remember from last time? Is it all just a blur? Dithering. Dithering. Okay. Anti-aliasing, analog-digital conversions. Analog to digital conversions. Okay. Although we spent most of our time talking about digital, right? Because yeah. yeah. Okay, and what about delays? Oh, delays and equations. Uh, what what about the relationship between delays and filters? Like you can have certain filters by using certain delays. Yeah, delay really short delays lead to filtering effects. Okay, uh, I think that was a key kind of moment of uh, hopefully realization, pulling things together basically. Because uh, when Leo asked that question, right? Well, won't that distort the sound? And the question, the answer is yes, but it's Predicting the ways that it's going to distort the sound or alter the sound, uh, uh, that it leads to the kind of advanced filtering. Okay, and a lot of the mathematics that I'm uh, sharing with you guys is mathematics that helps you understand and predetermine uh, what the filtering characteristics are going to be. Okay, for these different delays. Um, okay, so let's jump into kind of the the nook. I kind of ended here, right? Okay. Uh, and this equation, which uh, maybe a week ago, if you looked at it, you would have been like, what the heck is this saying, basically? Well, we kind of, we started to parse this out, right, in terms of what this means. So what does this y n mean here? Digital output, yes, okay. Yeah, so the square brackets means we're talking about a digital equation here, okay. And square brackets all the way through, yes, okay. Means that we're talking about a, 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 a description of a digital filter, okay? And the key word that you said was output. What told you that this Y in means output? Y, yes, okay. And you always relate your X's to your Y's, okay? And Y talks about outputs, X talks about inputs then, okay? So here we have then X in, X in minus one, and X in minus two. So what's the difference between X the n, the n minus one, and the n minus two, Colby. Uh, what, what does that minus one and minus two tell us? Uh, the two different delays. Two different delays, and one what, two what? Oh, milliseconds? Uh, is it milliseconds or is it? Microseconds. No, the a's and the coefficients. Oh. Yeah, he's right there. Okay. Um, yeah, what does this one mean? Sample. Samples, yes. Okay, it's one sample of delay. Okay, in effect, if you wanted to parse out what this y n means, it, you're basically saying for any n sample of the output, you get the solution for that sample by doing the following, basically. 
So this is basically for any output sample, you get the solution by combining those, these samples in this way. Okay. So n and n minus 1 and n minus 2 means basically n means the current input sample. n minus 1 means one sample delay of the input sample. n minus 2 means one, two samples delayed of the input sample. Okay. Same thing with the outputs. Okay. Why n minus 1 means there's one sample delay of the output. Why n minus 2 means it's two samples delayed of the output. So take the output, whatever the current output sample is, go back one sample, and that's the value you want. Go back two samples, and that's the value that you want. Okay? That's what these are telling you. Okay? It's always going to be minus y, because if minus means a delay, what would a plus mean? Ahead, right? Yeah, and can you ever, well, let's see, I'll put it this way. In a real-time application, can you ever read ahead on your input or your output? No, right? Think, think that through in terms of a thought experiment, okay? Sound is happening in real time. Microphone is turning that sound into digital samples. And I now, not, I don't just want to know what the current sample is 44,000 times per second. I actually want to know what sample is coming next. But if the sound is real time, you can't do that, right? You can't figure out what sound is coming next, okay? Um, and so there are, let's see, in digital signal theory, there are equations that will have pluses in them. But for real time applications, you always have to convert them so that everything, so the n is always the, the, the how should I put it, the, the, the furthest sample into the, the digital signal that you're reading, okay? Coming, okay. Making sure that it's n and then minus 1, minus 2, or minus whatever always ensures that you're looking at delays, which means that you can use it as a real-time application. Okay? In real-time audio, you can't look ahead at what's coming next. Okay? Um, okay, so we've already alluded to the A0, A1, A2. What are those? Coefficients, right? Okay. Which basically just means scale. Yeah, go ahead, say it. Scaling. scaling, yeah. We're scaling these values. We're adjusting the ratio, the weighting of these values, these sample values that we've recorded from our input and our output, okay? And we're changing the ratio of them in order to achieve our current output, okay? Um, which, by the way, affects these guys because these are past samples of output, right? So it presupposes that we've done this computation two times already before we know this value and then this value. Make sense? Okay. In a real-time application, you typically set your history to zero at the start, at the starting point, basically, for any delays, basically. So it's kind of understood that if for the for zeroth sample, okay, y n minus 1 is going to be set to 0, y n minus 2 is going to be set to 0, okay? As soon as we go to the first sample, well, now we know what the 0 with output sample was, so we can actually compute this part of the formula. As soon as we get to the second sample, then we know what the 0 with sample was and the first sample was, so we can compute this part of the formula, okay? So it's a matter of setting those values to 0 for the first few samples of your, of your, of your filter, okay? Um, Max takes care of all that for you underneath the hood, basically. But if you ever get into C++ programming, you've got to zero those things out, okay? Uh, and actually, uh, there is, uh, I, let me think. I take, I don't take it back, but a side note, as if, if you, who's the filter group? Have you guys uh, encountered, have you ever made the, have you made the bi-quad filter like blow up yet? Or where it just starts getting distorted and no sound comes out afterwards? Okay, uh, if you play around with these coefficients enough, you can actually make it just blow up. It explodes, basically. The, the, sample, the samples go out of range and no more sound comes out. There is actually a reset message that goes into the biquad, which zeroes out the memory, the history, so that all of these uh, delayed samples are zero again. Okay, it basically sets the initial condition. Okay, I think that's everything I wanted to recap here, basically. But it, the nice thing about the biquad equation is, is that it helps us recap 
most of the, the concepts that we covered last time, okay? Uh, inputs, outputs, coefficients, delays, okay? Um, okay, so when we're graphing the sound, okay, we've been, hopefully you're familiar with these two objects, yes? The one on the, the left and the one on the right. How many of you are familiar with the one on the left? Yes, you've used that at some point, okay? Uh, it's called scope object, scope tilde, okay? It's a, it's a GUI object, and it graphs uh, an X and Y dimension of the sound, which looks reminiscent of a waveform, right, from either Amadeus or Logic or Pro Tools, right, if you're familiar with these waveform graphs. What do we, well, I've already got the uh, Y dimension labeled for you there. Good, okay. Uh, it, this relates kind of back to my uh, graph from yesterday where we've got uh, ampli positive and negative amplitude on the Y axis, right? And that middle point means what? What value is that middle point on the, the left? The middle line. That the, yeah, it's zero. Okay. So above that line is, well, at the top would be one, right? Okay. Or positive one. At the bottom of the graph would be what? Negative one. Okay. So we've got positive and negative fluctuations in amplitude there. Okay. Uh, what then is on the x-axis? Time, okay. Uh, I think one, uh, one. I, don't know, I wouldn't call it a pet peeve, but uh, I think one thing to kind of be aware of with these these uh, signal scopes and signal graphing objects that come in Max MSP, they don't always have the labels on the axes, okay. So it it it's a good idea to know uh, what's being implied by these graphs, okay, in order to. Uh, understand what's being graphed. So you've got time versus amplitude, right? Okay, on the left. On the right, then, we have amplitude again, but notice I have the, the arrow pointing one direction. Where is zero on this uh, spectrogram object? Yeah, just say it out loud. With energy, with confidence. Zero is at the bottom, okay? So this is, this is zero amplitude at the bottom. This is normalized. It's uh, you know, it, I don't think it's any kind of dB basically, but I think it's normalized over to, to where this is like one at the top. Okay, so on the spectroscope or spectrogram or what is it called? It's spectro spectro something. This object here, okay, which is graphing um, frequency energy, the distribution of energy across frequencies. We've got amplitude again on the y-axis, but it's only positive amplitudes. Okay, we don't have negative amplitudes on this graph. Okay, uh, I think I'll come around full circle about why that is by the end of this, by the end of today. Okay, but then on the y-axis, what do we have? What, what what label will we put on the y-axis of a frequency graph? Frequency. frequency, yes. Okay, so we've got amplitude versus frequency. Uh, then uh, we've talked about where the zero is and the one is on the uh, on the y-axis. Where is zero on the on the x-axis? Would you assume? Leo's pointing over here. So yes, this lower left-hand corner over here is where zero in terms of frequency is. Okay, and then what is this point over here? Twenty-two thousand. Why did you go there? Nyquist frequency. Nyquist frequency. Yes. Okay. So actually, actually, that's that's exactly my point. Basically, we've got zero hertz on this corner over here. And the other end of the spectrogram is the Nyquist frequency, okay? Um, Max is usually kind enough to adjust that for you if you have different uh, sampling rates on different computers, okay? Uh, but be aware that you're, you're looking at a frequency graph that runs from zero to the Nyquist frequency, okay? Um, so when we're graphing a filter, right? Have you used the filter graph object, guys? Uh, yes, okay. So it connects to your biquad, it lets you control things, okay? Again, we have amplitude and frequency our, as our y and our x uh, dimensions. And again, we're talking about zero hertz to the Nyquist frequency, okay? Except that where's zero in this one? You can even see this one does have a, the, the dimension labeled for us, which is nice. Uh, on, the, on the one on the left. Yeah, it's in the center, right? Okay. So 
contrary to the spectrogram where we had zero at the bottom and we were interested in whether there was any energy at a specific frequency, okay, as we moved from zero to the Nyquist. Here we're talking about changes in the energy at specific frequencies, okay? So that's why zero is in the middle. We can talk about a positive change or a negative change in the energy at a specific frequency, okay? So when you have a peak, so this is a peak filter here, okay? When you have, when you have the, the solid line hugging the zero but then moving up, what it's describing is that frequencies in this range pass through unchanged. Here, zero dB means no change in the energy. And as soon as it starts to go up into the positive dimension, we're talking about a boost in energy, and then we're coming back down to the zero line where there's no, uh, uh, back to, I guess, a state of rest, I guess, where there's no change in energy down here, okay? If this graph instead went down and back up, one would we call it a notch filter, and a peak notch filter is really just how, where you set the gain, basically, okay? Um, but we would be talking about neg not negative um, amplitudes, negative amplitude energy. We're talking about decreases in amplitude. We're lowering the dB at this specific frequency, okay? So that's why we have zero in the center on this graph, okay? Uh, but the dimensions are the same, okay? This is why I'm, sometimes I'm a stickler for labeling your dimensions, basically, okay? Uh, but then we have, so I, I've got these two objects, these two graphical user interface objects feeding into the same biquad object. What can you assume then for what it, their relationship is to the biquad object? They're both going into the same inlet, so do you think they, they output the same sort of information? Is that a safe assumption? Michael's sort of shape. Yeah, what? I have no idea what that thing is. You have no idea what that thing is. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it looks like a treasure map. Yes, okay. Uh, what it is, okay, so this is what's called a, a Z plane diagram. Okay. Uh, I'm going to dissect a little bit about what that is in a minute. Um, but the reason they're both, they both can connect to the biquad object is they both output the same set of information. Okay, so extrapolating up from that, what it means is that there are two different ways of looking at the same information. Okay, so you understand the graph on the left. My goal today is to give you a little bit of an understanding of what the graph on the right means. Okay, because they both are ways to describe filters and control filters. You can control it versus with a frequency amplitude diagram. You can also control it with this... Uh, this z-plane diagram, okay? These, the way this works in Max, you can actually grab this x and, these x's and zeros and actually move them around and change your filter ca co co characteristics, okay? Uh, so, the z-plane, what does it mean, okay? In a sense, it's more basic than filter graph, okay? Um, you've got x's, x's are what are called poles, or sometimes it's referred to as a pole zero diagram, Okay, because you've got poles and zeros. Okay, um, the poles are caused by feedback delays. Now, I didn't. I don't know. I didn't use this terminology here. Okay, but a feedback delay. Well, what do you know about feedback? When you've encountered feedback before in just a live situation, the microphone goes. Ooh. It's, it's recording a loop and it's playing it back to the speaker and it's coming back. The speaker again. Yeah. Just keep getting louder and louder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's exactly it. You used, except you used the one word that we haven't been using, which is the speakers coming back and going out. And what's what's coming from the speaker? It's coming out of the speaker, right? It's the output getting mixed back into the input. Okay. So haven't we been talking about outputs and inputs and mixing those two things together? Okay. So feedback delays are where output has been mixed back into the source. Feed forward delays are where input has been, and delayed versions of the input have been mixed back into the source. Okay? So feed back is output being mixed back in. Feed forward is input being mixed back in. Okay? On this diagram, X doesn't mark the spot. It represents a feedback delay. 
O represents a feed for delay. Okay, that's why I say it's it's a more it's a simpler, cruder diagram of these this filter relationship. Okay, um, the distance from the origin then is the coefficient is the coefficient that you use on that delay. Okay, so not x and then y, but the hypotenuse of the triangle, if you remember, right, it was a squared, b squared, c squared, Pythagorean theorem kind of thing, okay? Um, that's going to be the coefficient, the distance from here to here, okay? Um, let's see here. Now, why is it a circle? Because here, right, we're dealing with a, a square, right? How do we get from a rectangle to a circle, okay? Because here we've got... Zero and then Nyquist, and everybody understands that it's a continuum, and we have the beginning and we have the end, and we're done, and everybody's happy. Okay, how can we get from a rectangle to a circle? Well, I'm glad I asked because let's see here, I have to wait for my little build. There. Okay. That's where pi comes in. Pi has a connection to the Nyquist frequency. Okay. Say it again. Pi has a connection to the Nyquist frequency. And I think this is my next slide. Okay. No, well, it's my next, next slide. So I'll come back to the Nyquist thing. Okay. You may not have seen those z-plane diagrams, but you probably, if you've looked at some of your block diagrams that are showing up in your readings, you may have seen some notation like this. Z to the power of negative 1. Has anyone seen that show up in a block diagram somewhere in a textbook? If not, you may have just like skimmed past it. Z to the negative 1 means a one-sample delay. It's a notation for a one-sample delay. Shorthand, I mean, it's, it's, it's easier to write Z to the power, negative power 1 than it is to write one-sample delay, typically. Okay, so in engineering flow diagrams, you'll often see Z to the power of negative 1. Okay, this Z directly connects to the Z plane that we were just talking about and this description of filters through the Z plane. Okay, so that, that Z comes from the fact that it's a reference to the Z plane. Okay, so next time you see Z to the negative one, you know that that's, oh, that's a one sample delay going through there, basically. And typically it's a more complicated, I mean, this is just really input, delay at one sample, output. Okay, but typically there'll be some sort of branch like this, that's like and a plus sign here showing you that they're, you're mixing the signals together after the delay. Okay, so that's Z to the negative one. Next time that shows up, okay. Nyquist, okay. Uh, let's see here. Pi. Yeah. Okay. I want to make sure I got this right. Okay. Pi is just another name for the Nyquist frequency when you're graphing that circle. Okay. So here, this is zero hertz. This is the Nyquist frequency over here. This is your sampling rate over here as you come back around. Okay, so I'll, I'll do that again. Zero, then you go around the circle this way to the Nyquist, then you go back around this way to the sampling rate. Okay, that's what this is showing basically. So the Z, the Z plane, whereas the filter graph shows you from zero to the Nyquist, the Z plane shows you from zero to the sampling rate, the effects on, on any frequency. Okay, and let's see, in effect, it helps you realize what might happen, say, if an anti-aliasing filter is not in the equation and, and a frequency gets in there. Okay, that's that's beyond the Nyquist frequency. Okay, it describes what will happen. Okay, so pi is just another name for Nyquist. Other names that will show up in your reading: sample rate, the SR divided by two, just means sample rate divided by two half the sampling rate. Um, sometimes it will be F sub S, so it's frequency sampling divided by two, okay? Sometimes it'll be notated as F sub N for N for Nyquist, okay? And Harry, Harry Nyquist, before Nyquist was a frequency, it was a person, okay? Harry Nyquist is the, is the physicist who described this uh, for us. Uh, this, this theory that um, uh, you must, you must sample at twice the, 
the fr twice the frequency that you the highest frequency you want to record. Sorry, it took me a while to build that sentence in my head for some reason. You must be able you must sample at twice the highest frequency you want to be able to record. That was Nyquist's theorem before it was the Nyquist theorem. Okay, and Harry is his first name. Okay, in case anyone ever asks you that on a Friday night trivia question, I don't know whatever is that. Did they do that on any, yeah, anyway? Uh, maybe I don't know. Uh, next time it's on Jeopardy. Okay, he'll well, know. Harry Nyquist. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, well, let's see. Now I'm doing. Okay, so how do we get from talking about f time and amplitude to frequency and amplitude? Okay, I had, to, I had to figure out what my segue was here. Okay. Um, we do that by measuring the filter. Okay. Uh, and the way that you measure the filter, the way you measure the frequency response of the filter so that you can graph it, is through what's called its impulse response. Okay? So everybody connecting those dots here? Frequency response is how we measure and describe a filter. We measure the frequency response using its impulse response is another way to talk about it. Uh, and uh, in order to do that, we need a unit impulse. Okay, the unit impulse is a as a kind of test signal. Okay, rather than testing it with a sine wave, some a lot of times people will use like a thousand hertz sine wave, right? Pot pumped into a system to kind of test its balance, right? To test its amplitude level. You take out the level meter, or pink noise is another test si signal, right? You're testing the noise level. You're using a, a level meter to figure out how loud the system is. Okay. An impulse response or a unit impulse is a signal that you can run through a filter and determine its unique characteristics. Okay, and it, it's defined thusly. Okay, this is the definition of a del of a unit impulse. Okay, if n equals zero, then the output should be one. If n does not equal zero, then the output should be zero. Think about that logically. So if 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 we're at the tenth sample, what's the value going to be? Zero. If we're at the 164th sample, what's the value going to be? Okay. If we're at the zeroth sample, what's the value going to be? One. Okay. It's one sample of of uh, maximum positive amplitude, and then everything else zero. Okay. And sending that one sample of maximum positive amplitude through your filter allows you to get its response to that impulse. Okay? Has impulse response turned up in any of your readings, that, that term, impulse response? Maybe. Maybe? Okay. <laughs> okay. All an impulse response is, it's basically you're, you're measuring what the filter does in response to this, this impulse. Okay, this one little pop of energy. Okay, and uh, I mean, to put it in concrete terms, uh, I don't have this set up here, but I should be able to do this pretty quickly. Okay, we got max. Uh, there's actually an object for this. Click, create an impulse. Drop in my easy deck. And I'm not connected to the speakers, but I could be. Let's see. Da, da, da. Or, you all want to hear this? Okay, get ready because this is going to be awesome. What does an impulse response sound like? Oh, I need a bang button because that's how this operates. Turn it up. There it is. Is that anticlimactic? Okay. So it's one, everything, all the click object does, it puts out a bunch of zeros, and as soon as it receives a bang, it sends one sample of maximum positive amplitude out. Okay? But by taking that and feeding it into a filter, capturing the way it responds to it, you actually know quite a lot about that filter. Okay? Um, to give you an example, I don't know. You guys that are in the filter group, what's 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 a filter you guys have been looking at? Comb. Comb, okay. That's a good choice. Uh, we're gonna need some 
some, uh, I'm going to just cheat a little bit and grab something that has some, oh, let me do that. Okay, wow, that's a lot, that's bigger. Something that has some settings already, because comb without any settings doesn't do much. So do this, this. Oh, I'm not hearing much. Awesome. Maybe it needs those other, let's see, 15. Oh, because isn't that... Oh, yeah, an initial delay of one sample, that's not going to do much. So let's see, where's the one? Apply comb filter effect, apply comb filter effect, that doesn't tell me much. Let's change it to six. Can you hear anything? Not much. As opposed to if I go to... Uh, this is what happens when I take a detour and I don't have this planned ahead, right? And maybe I turn up the feedback gain here. Gain coefficient, feed forward gain, feedback gain. Yeah, the feedback is this, so let me turn up this coefficient here. Ah, okay. Now I got something different out of it, okay. I was a little worried we were just going to hear a bunch of clicks, basically. Even when they're really short and they just sound like clicks to us, Sometimes it can be a variation of over six samples that we can't hear, but if you capture those six samples, you can actually tell quite a lot about the, the sample. I was trying to get something that's a little more extended so we can hear the effects, okay? So all I'm doing is sending one sample of maximum amplitude into this comb filter, and I get that as an output, okay? I can actually record that output, and what that output looks like tells me a lot about the filter itself, okay? It's, it's impulse response, okay? Uh, I don't know, in, in, in audio recording production, right, you may have talked about in terms of microphones, the, the transient response of the microphone, did that come up? No, maybe? Okay, it's how it reacts to kind of a sudden change in sound, okay? So different things have impulse response. You can actually take the impulse response of a room, and I think we mentioned this with convolution reverb, okay? What convolution reverb is, you take an actual physical room and play one of these pops into it, record the sound of, the, of that pop in the room, and you can then reapply it to new sounds based on that, okay? So impulse response becomes a very powerful diagnostic tool, if you will, for, for audio, okay? But it all starts with this knowing what the impulse signal looks like, okay? So to show you in just some very, very simple filters what this does, how it alters the output, okay? So on the left, I've consistently put the unit impulse as our input, okay? So I'm putting those as my inputs to these filters and recording what it does to the outputs on the right-hand side, okay? And in this case, because we're only talking about five samples and we're talking about a very simple math problem here, it's, it's, it's possible to do these in your head, okay? At least, I hope it's possible to do it. If your, input, if your zero sample is one of input, x zero is one, okay? So now, in order to know what y zero is going to be, we take 0.5 times x zero, which is 0.5 times one, so 0.5 times one is 0.5, right? Okay. And as I told you, the delays have all been set to zero, so this 0.5 times zero means that this part of the equation disappears, right? Okay. So 0.5 plus zero means that our output is 0.5. Okay. Go to the next step. Okay. If I want to know what y one is, okay, I take 0.5 times x. 1, x1 happens to be 0, so that means that this part of the equation cancels out, and 0.5 times x0, or it's, it's x, we're at x1, so 1 minus 1 means I need to know the value at x0, so I go back to x0, pull up a 1, 0.5 times 1 means 0 0.5, 0 plus 0.5 means that 0.5 is my output, that's my output, okay? I'll do one more here. As soon as I get to x2, right, 
I want to know what y2 is. Well, 0.5 times x2, which happens to be 0, means that this is 0. 0.5 times x2 minus 1, or x1, means this time is 0. So I've got 0 plus 0, which means my output should be 0. Can we see how that works? And the same would be true x3 and x4. OK? This is what your computer is doing 44,100 times a second, or 96,000 times a second, basically, OK? As you, or whatever your sampling rate is, OK, on your filter. OK? This uh, is an example of our, so I've already introduced this term feed forward delay, right? We're delaying a copy of the input, so we're feeding it forward. So that's what we call a feed forward delay, OK? A feed-forward delay is always going to have what's called a finite impulse response. What, what do you know, what's, finite is the opposite of? Infinite, right? Okay. So if, some, so if the opposite of a finite impulse response would be then an infinite impulse response. Okay. So we define filters as having a finite impulse response if we know that when the unit impulse goes in, eventually the output's going to end. It has a finite duration for its output. Okay? It doesn't theoretically go on and on and on. Okay? And feed forward delays are always finite impulse response delays. Okay? Or always have a finite, finite impulse response. Okay? Let's look at subtraction. Here we need a bipolar graph. Okay? Walk me through this, uh, Eric. So if I, I want to know y0, how do I walk through this formula? Well, point, point 0.5 times 1 is what? You said point one, point 0.5, okay. So then we're going to subtract, or you can actually also think of this as uh, plus negative point 0.5 times, right? And because we go, we're going back before the zero sample, it's, it's going to actually pull out a zero, right? Because we've, we've set that precondition up, okay? So this part of the equation ends up being zero. So we've got 0.5 minus 0 means that we have a result of 0.5, right? Okay. Robert, walk me through how do I get the first sample of output? Like, um, can you find out what y0 is? Yeah, how do you find out? Well, no, how do you find out what y1 is? Because I've got a graph that is negative 5, right? Negative 0.5. OK. Who wants to help him out? How do I find the output sample? I've got output y1 as being negative 5. How did I get that result? You said x1. Uh -huh. And you uh, 1 minus 1 is 0, and 0 times 0.5 is 0, so that side cancels out, and then you go to uh, 0.5 times 1 again, and it's just 0.5, so you get the graph to find out the number 0.5. Right. Okay. Did you follow what he's saying, or you need to walk through it? Okay. Because if I need to know y1 here, this also becomes x1. And this become the n here is one, so one minus one means I need to access sample zero here. Okay, so it's input sample zero, which happens to be one. When I multiply it by, think of this as plus negative point five. So negative point five times one means that I get negative point five. This ends up being zero because x one is zero, right? So that's how I get negative point five over here because 0 minus 0.5 equals 
negative 0.5. Okay. And everybody sees how it zeroes out after a, after those two samples. Okay. Okay. So let's look at a feedback situation. It gets a little more complicated here. Leo, you feeling brave? How do I? How okay? The what, say again? How do I get 0.5 as my zeroth output sample? Mm -hmm. So one times point five, you get zero. Times point five. Mm -hmm. But do we multiply first? Well, we yeah, we multiply first. So we have a zero on this side, and then we go and get whatever sample that is minus zero minus one, which is zero. Mm -hmm. And then when we multiply, no, it's one. It's one, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, right. The, the thing you have to keep ahead, straight in your head, when I say the zeroth sample, I'm talking about n. n equals zero. And when n equals zero, it's, it's just an array of numbers at that point. Okay? I want to go grab the zeroth one off the shelf, which in this case happens to have a value of one. Okay? So 0.5 times one equals 0.5 plus. 0.5 times whatever my output was at negative 1, which again doesn't exist, so it, it gets a 0. Okay, So it's 0.5 plus 0, and that's where I get my output of 0.5. Okay, Michael, then what happens with the first sample? For the first sample, uh, you look at x1, and it's 0, so 0 0.5 times 0 is 0, so that side cancels out. Mm -hmm. And then we look at the output at uh, n minus 1, which would be 1 minus 1, which is the output at position 0. So that's 0 0.5. So 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 is 0 0.25. So that's your, your output for the y1. OK. So y1 equals 0 0.25. Eric, what, what, how would I get my output for y2 then? You would the output for y2. Yeah. Walk me through the process of computing the output for y2. You would go through, you take your input 2, which is equal to 0, so the opposite side cancels out. Mm -hmm. You would go and just take the output of. Go for it. We're at 2, so we go y1. back to 1, yeah. Right. Okay. So walk me through this process of I'm constantly going to be pulling the last output sample and multiplying it by 0.5. Okay. And relate, let's relate it back to, I'll, I'll call on Monica because I asked you for the opposite of finite is infinite, right? Why, what conditions cause this to be infinite? Okay. Yeah, I'm constantly adding a little bit of the output back in. Okay. And so am I ever going to get so in this I always reached a condition where it was going to be 0 for the rest of infinity, right? Okay. It was always going to be 0 for the rest of my signal. At this point, can I say I'm ever going to reach 0? No, because I'm always going at half of the last output, right? And if you keep going half the distance, you never get to 0 theoretically. Okay, now in computers, this gets a little more complicated because eventually you're going to get to an amplitude value that's less than one bit. It's less than one bit of flipping back and forth, right? Okay, and at that point, it will reach zero for the sound card. It might not reach zero for the processor. Okay. Uh, this was something we encountered when uh, Apple was making the transition from power PCs to Intel chips. Power PCs had this great thing about them where when the numbers got too small to matter, it would just zero out the circuit. 
Intel chips do not have this thing. So all of a sudden, everybody's reverb algorithms that had feedback in them, when they got to these really small numbers, all of a sudden the CPU would start spiking because the, the CPU is trying to compute smaller and smaller numbers with greater and greater accuracy, which is a good thing when you're dealing with, I don't know, interest and inflation and those kind of scientific problems, right? But when you're talking about sound going to the sound card and sound that's so quiet that it's within one bit flipping back and forth, it doesn't matter and there was no way to tell the computer that uh, it doesn't matter and so it was computing these really, really small numbers and so everybody's, everybody's reverb algorithms were actually really CPU intensive at their quietest, which is precisely when they shouldn't be CPU intensive, right? Okay, because there were these really small numbers, okay? Um, that, that condition is called denormals, is what they're called. Uh, and so you have to, most reverb algorithms now actually have a little extra circuit in there that checks for these really, really small numbers that don't matter in terms of the aural output, and they just zero out the circuit, basically, to stop the, the computation from happening. But, but it's all because they're infinite impulse, uh, they have an infinite impulse response in this situation, okay? Same thing is true of subtraction, okay? I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm going to kind of gloss over this and move on to the next point, but you see how it kind of, uh, subtraction creates this condition where we have a bipolar output, okay? So things that were only positive end up being positive and negative on the output side as the, as the condition continues, okay? Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, how do we get from in frequency response? Well, I'm glad I asked. Uh, we have to then take these impulse responses, run them through an algorithm to uh, a Fourier transform, which is something that was on our list of, of uh, processes, yes, for uh, processing sound, okay? A Fourier transform actually lets us go from a time domain signal to a frequency domain, a frequency representation of what's happening in that signal. Uh, when you see this graph, uh, I guess, notated mathematically, the capitalization of the letter always changes, okay? So time domain signals are going to be lowercase x's and y's. Frequency domain signals are going to be uppercase x's and y's, okay? I don't know that I want to get into the E, J, W, and, and what happens with... Um, uh, this is the same E that's the mathematical constant E, and I, I actually get into kind of gray areas at this point as well, too. The main thing to realize is that you should use capital or lowercase uh, x's and y's. That does matter, basically. And the other thing that you need to understand is that you capture the impulse response, put it through a Fourier transform, and it tells you what the frequency characteristic of the filter is. So you actually take something that's in the time domain, flip it, and move it into the frequency domain, and it's, it describes the frequency response of the filter. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's, it's actually these impulse responses and capturing them that lets us accurately graph what's going to happen with the, the filters in the frequency domain, these dips and valleys that are happening. Okay, so there's, they're directly related. Okay, um, let me see what I have next year. Okay, so taking these time domain impulse responses turning them into frequency response graphs, okay? So here we have that same feed forward delay with addition, okay? If we graph it uh, in the frequency domain, this is what it looks like, okay? On the bottom, on the x-axis, we have uh, what in this case is referred to as normalized frequency. This is zero to the Nyquist frequency on the x-axis, okay? And this is, you see zero is toward the top of the y-axis there, and we're descending into negative amplitudes or dampening of the, those amplitudes, those fre frequent, uh, let's see, dampening of those frequencies by a certain a specific amplitude at these given points, basically. And so on the x-axis, we have low frequencies on the left, high frequencies on the right. How would you describe this in that basic pass terminology that we typically use when describing filters? What types of frequencies pass through this filter? Low frequencies. low frequencies. Why do you say low frequencies? The lower ones have more. Yeah, the lower ones have more amplitude, have a higher amplitude. 
okay, they're closer to zero. And you're getting negative or dampening effects as you go toward the Nyquist frequency, toward higher frequencies. So we see that? Does it look kind of like a, I mean, let me see. Does that, let me see, can I, uh, if you're familiar with the filter graph, right? Oh, come on, you're gonna let me, oh, I have to unlock it first. Okay, take my filter graph, I'm gonna put it in, it's in peak notch mode right now, but I'll put it in low pass mode. Okay, lock it. Can we see what that looks like? You, you sh should be used to a low pass graph like this, yes, from using a DAW. Okay, so you see how that shape is reminiscent of that shape. Okay, there's not as much control there, I will tell you, to be honest, but it is a low pass filter. Low frequencies are going to pass through more easily than high frequencies are. And in fact, as you approach the Nyquist, it starts attenuating drastically. Okay? So with one sample of delay on your input, mixing it, mixing it together with the current sample, you actually can get a very basic low pass filter. Okay? Next up, so if, if, if you've got low pass, Obviously, you know the high pass is coming, right? Because that's the opposite. Okay. What changed in my formula over here? Yeah. Same ratio, 0.5 and 0.5. All I'm doing is taking that sampled, sig uh, that, that delayed signal. I'm subtracting it from the input rather than add adding it to the input. And I all of a sudden get a high pass filter rather than a low pass filter. Again, to relate it to this, you guys were looking at something with a little bit more detail, like this. Yes. Okay. High pass filter. High pass filter. Okay. So again, the only difference here is whether we're adding or subtracting that delayed signal. Okay. Make sense? Okay. See you later. Um, so, that's our feed forward situation where we're adding in input. Let's see what happens when we feed back. Changes the shape. I don't know. How would we describe this? Would we describe this as a I don't know, a band pass or a high pass or a, a shelf maybe? Okay. But you see how it creates a peak down here toward the, the or excuse me, up here toward the Nyquist frequency. And we've got a little bit of a trough down here toward, the, toward zero hertz. Okay. That's created by feedback, this feedback situation. Okay. And then, so if, if, Addition and subtraction reversed the this picture. What do you think is going to happen to this one if we switch it to subtraction? It's going to reverse it, yes. Oh, no, I put the wrong picture in. Darn it. Pay no attention to that graph. Let me go pull the right one in. Oh, oh, it's a wrong graph there. Okay, I've got the wrong graph. It does reverse it, seriously. Undo. That's the right one. I'll put it the other way. I'll put it in the other way. Okay. So how to so this is this is just one sample of delay, okay? It gets more complicated the longer the delay is. And that's where I wanted to kind of give you this patch. Okay, so scoot back to the computers, log on to Blackboard, and I've got this uh, patch set up on Blackboard for you. Which should I don't want to save that. Looks something like this. I'm going to fit this on the screen. Okay. I pulled this from the plot help pot patch, but I've added some extra notation as far as what we're talking about here, okay? What you have is effectively an eight sample 
uh, feed forward and feed back uh, delay. So you've got eight samples of delay set up here on the top. And what you can put into these number boxes are the coefficients that you want to apply to those samples of delay. So in this case, right now, the default when you first launch the patch is 1 and 1. So you've got 1 applied to x0 and you've got 1 applied to y0. My advice, keep 1 on y0 at all times. Why would you want to do that? Keep the coefficient on y0 at 1. And I was asking, why would, you, why would you need to do that? If I change it to 0, what happens? Yeah, I, it, when I change the, the coefficient on y0, y0 to 0, I'm effectively blocking my, all my output at that point. Okay, So go ahead and keep that one at 1. Okay, and actually, you, well, you can play with it a little bit. You can see how if I, oh, that's weird, it goes up rather than down. That's unintuitive. <laughs> anyway, okay, but the point, the point being, it, it messes with your filter if you change this 1 on y0, okay? So let's look back at, um, you should be able to get some of these conditions. So if you've got 0.5 on x, x0 and say uh, x, minus 1, let's see here, so to do this is 0. 0.5, and this is, I guess I should have labeled these as negative numbers, should I have, yeah. Can you see that? You can kind of start to create some of these shapes that I was playing with here. Um, I did it with feedback. But now if I change, so uh, that was that graph that I was trying to get reversed. If I simply put in negative 0.5 here, there, now it reverses the graph. And what we're looking at is the frequency response of adding, uh, or excuse me, subtracting half of my output delayed by one sample. So this is a more interactive way to look, generate some of these graphs. And each one of these is an increasing by one sample of delay. So uh, let me look at this. Let me think here. You should be able to pretty quickly create some of the other graphs that I had up here. But you can also start to experiment and see what happens as you mix these successively incrementally more delayed samples to the original source. So for instance, if I, well, let's, let's do it this way. Rather than mix multiples, um, let me do this. 0, and I'll put a 0.5 here. Everybody see what happened? Let me pull this down here. So what I want you to see is the difference between, I'm, I'm just going to play with the feed forward coefficients, the coefficients on the input delays, okay? So my, my graph that I showed you before was this, right? This low pass filter, okay? Watch what happens when I move this, I change this back to zero, but I move my 0.5 to here. Okay, now watch what happens if I change this to zero and put this at 0.5. And then if I put 0.5 on x4, change this back to 0, what's happening to this pattern? Are you seeing a pattern? Uh, I guess I should start with that question. Every other sample is going it's like dipping down to negative 60 plus. Yeah, so let's see here. Yeah, it's dipping down to negative 60 dB uh, every so many frequencies, okay? And you can tell which frequencies. Since 1 is the Nyquist, at 0.6 the Nyquist, and at 0.2 the Nyquist, it's going to have a dip in the, in the overall 
frequency response. Uh, a dip so much that it's going to be quiet at that frequency if there's any input, anything in your input, okay? But as you progressively move this coefficient over to different samples, okay, what you'll notice is that, I don't know, do you see the relationship between this pattern at x6 and this pattern at x2, excuse me, do we see the relationship between that pattern and that pattern? No? Yes? Yeah? Half as many dips as the sample delay. So if I go to two, I should get one dip, right? This is, there it is, okay. Half as many dips as the sample delay. Or if you, if you go to an odd number, put this at zero again. That's effectively half the shape, right? That's half the shape. Now we get one full shape. Now we get one and a half shapes, right? Now we get two shapes. Okay, this dip structure, all the way down, all the way back up. Okay, so for that, what? What Michael said is exactly right. Every sample that we increase the delay, we effectively take this pattern of a dip in the frequency spectrum and we start to repeat it over a shorter and shorter amount of uh, uh, a band of frequencies. Okay, it's as if this, it's as if this pattern existed in infinite directions to infinitely high frequencies and infinitely low frequencies and it starts to fold back in on itself as you increase the delay. It's kind of taking that pattern and scrunching it together. Okay? And it's that this infinite structure, by the way, is exactly why there's a z-plane diagram. Because if you think about it, the circle, the infinite circle, right? The fact that you go around all the way back to 2 pi and you're back where you started, okay? The same thing happens with frequencies in filters. Eventually, you get back around to where you started as you go up through the frequency spectrum. This pattern exists in infinite directions. We're just simply scrunching it up into a shorter and shorter uh, frequency band as we increase the delay. So we can, that's why we can go from a low-pass filter to a comb filter. Because this is a low pass filter, but this, sorry, it takes two steps, is a comb filter. And the, the longer we make the delay on the comb filtering effect, the closer these the teeth of the comb get together. Okay? It's really just one big pattern that we're manipulating in the frequency spectrum using delays. Does that make any sense? I'm hoping because it's it's this big idea that's out there that for me when for me when I realize that it's just one big long pattern and I'm 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 scrunching it up and I'm pulling it apart and I'm doing this, uh, it's like a light bulb went off basically. And I could I could kind of see it in my head basically the fact that we're it's a low pass filter and now we're just scrunching it up and creating a comb filter by increasing the delay time. Okay. Yeah, no, maybe, here, okay. So filters, it's all one big happy family, basically. Okay? But the nice thing about this is you can actually test uh, different combinations of this. So you can see, well, what if I put a 0.6 on this one, and you start to get interesting shapes. Uh, this is where you were talking about, I, don't know, I mentioned last time biquads, right, and the fact that out of a biquad, you can get all these different filter types, okay? But by having multiple stage filters like this, you can actually get some really nuanced shapes where you've got, you know, a, a, a low-pass filter that cuts off at 96 hertz, 
uh, or 96, excuse me, 9,600 hertz, and a stop band that's way down here at 96 dB, so you don't actually hear anything in the stop in the band of frequencies that you're trying to reject. Okay. Uh, that's what this uh, filter design. That's where this goes, basically. There's a whole science to filter designing in this. Okay, and that's where companies like Waves can charge four hundred dollars for their uh, their bandpass filters that they put all this research into making sure that it's tuned perfectly and it has the right phase response and all that sort of stuff too. Okay, yeah, cool. Um, I noticed that you can't be you said it can't be zero first sample. Does that mean that like every filter and that we use, like adjust the volume before you even start hearing it, even if it's just a like, very minuscule amount. I, yeah, I think you should adjust the volume before you get into it because like, if I do this as zero, it'll work without zero. Uh, what effectively happens when you change, well, let's see, does this, does this work with, if I just do one here and zero here? Uh, I guess that works too. Yeah. You're, you. If you don't have this uh, zeroth sample set to one, you're effectively introducing a z one sample delay into your overall signal. Uh, usually in a real-time application, you want to get the signal out as quickly as possible. So that's why you usually will start with a one. And so actually, uh, let's see. Can I do this? Write these down. Let me, let me make it a little simpler. This, if I took these coefficients and just slid them down all one box, I should get roughly the same diagram. Let me see if that's true. Prove my point here. If I can remember these numbers. Negative 0.38. Or you know what I'll do here? Before I do it, let me take a screenshot. Okay, just to prove to myself, this is the diagram, right? Okay. Negative 0 0.38, 0, 0.6, 0, 1, 1, 0. So compare that. Everybody see that? It's effectively the same diagram. See that? This was I, all I did was take all my coefficients and slide them one to the right, and I ended up with the same diagram. The difference is going to be that I've actually introduced a delay into my signal that didn't need to be there. I can by sliding it all over to the left, it'll come out one sample sooner. And this is, by the way, why you have to be careful about delays uh, when you have multiple copies of sound, right? Uh, if you accidentally like bump your, if you've got two recordings of something, you accidentally bump one, you can actually introduce filtering effects. Uh, or differences where you have multiple mic situations. The, the distance creates a delay, right? So that actually can produce a filtering effect in your recording process. Okay, yeah. Yeah, phasing. I mean, phasing is part of this too. I've kind of I've left out phase, group delay, all that sort of stuff. But because the phase response is the other component of this, my experience is that it's challenging enough to get your heads around frequency response, <laughs> right? Without me muddying the waters with with delay, because you can you can actually graph this like it's going to delay. 20 hertz by five samples, but it's going to delay 100 hertz only by one sample, and 1,000 hertz is going to be delayed by zero samples. You can, it actually creates delays at specific frequencies in the sound. Uh, in addition to phase, it's going to change the phase response as well. I don't know if these guys are going to get into all pass filters or not. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> an all pass, I mean, the reason it's called an all pass filter is that all frequencies pass. Uh, there's no change in amplitude, but there are changes in phase, which can yield some interesting results. Yeah. So are EQ set up like this too, like for zero would be like your first band, and one would be the second band, because I know it's kind of looks like EQ, like you can start messing with the numbers. Is there just like other variables that are added to it? 
they've typically tuned these coefficients and done a lot of research to get the right sound out of these coefficients to give you the, the relationship, that, the, the, the sound quality that they want out of the filter. So that's typically, that's where the money comes in basically. They've done a lot of time and research to get the right coefficients and to change the, the coefficients over time as you select which frequency. Because right, this, this creates a nice peak up here toward the Nyquist, but what if I want this peak to be over here, right? There's mathematical formulas that you have to bolt on top of this to output the coefficients for your delays. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. 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 All right. I know this is really, really technical stuff. I hope this gave you a window into understanding some of these formulas and what's going on in there. Hopefully, if 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 nothing else, it might give us a resource of uh, ideas and concepts to come back to as I help you work through the articles. Tuesday is going to be a work day, so come with stuff, come with questions, come with uh, things that you need fixed. Uh, I'll help you work through that on Tuesday before I head out. And then you'll have two work days where I won't be here, but Dylan will be here, but the room will be here, and you guys have this time available, so take advantage of that with your, for your groups to get working on your projects and be ready for presentations. Uh, annotated bibliographies, can you guys have those done on Tuesday for me? Good, because it'll be good to talk through uh, if there are any additional resources or things you're misunderstanding about your, your resources, I can talk about those on Tuesday, okay? Okay, I'll see you all then. Have a good weekend. <laughs>